Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of all of us at the locally based, independently owned bookstore, Books and Books in Miami, Florida, and in partnership with Charis Books in Decatur, Georgia, White Whale Bookstore in Pittsburgh, PA, Politics and Prose in Washington, DC, Literati in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and McNally Jackson in New York City, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a virtual evening with Sheila Hetty to discuss her new novel, Pure Color, just published today by our friends at Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. Sheila Hetty is the author of several books of fiction and nonfiction, including Motherhood and How Should a Person Be, which New York Magazine called one of the new classics of the 21st century. She was named one of the new vanguard by the book critics of the New York Times, who along with a dozen other magazines and newspapers chose motherhood as a top book of 2018. Her books have been translated into 21 languages. To moderate this evening's conversation, we're joined by Sarah Rule, a playwright and writer of other things. Her 15 plays include In the Next Room or The Vibrator Play, The Clean House and Eurydice. She has been a two-time Pulitzer Prize finalist a Tony Award nominee, and the recipient of the MacArthur Genius Fellowship. She's received the Steinberg Playwright Award and the Samuel French Award, among many others. She teaches at the Yale School of Drama. Just a quick reminder that throughout this evening's broadcast, you can post questions below in the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen, so don't be shy. We're so grateful for your support of indie bookstores Everyone watching tonight has purchased a copy of Pure Color that will be shipped right out to you. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Hello and welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thanks to all the bookstores for participating. That's, that's hearing the Amazing. list really moved me. Yeah. Me too. And I couldn't be more excited to ask questions of Sheila because um, I always want to talk to her and engage her prodigious, amazing brain. And I also, this book, I just feel like holding it up. I, I love this book so dearly. And you can see it's all um, dog eared. And um, it was, it's so moving to me, this book, the form you found for it. And, and in a way, it feels like a kind of subjective realism to me. You know, it's it's very surreal. A woman falls into a leaf and, and comes out of a leaf again. But it actually feels to me, it describes very accurate, accurately to me what it's like to be alive right now in this particular moment. And I guess my first question for you is, how did you find the form of it? Did you did you start it knowing what the form was? Did you write not knowing where you were going? Um, I like that you said that it was realism rather than surrealism or allegory or something like that, because that's what it felt like to me, like trying to capture the real feelings that I was experiencing over the three years that I was writing the book, which kept changing because a year after I started the writing the book, my father died. And so you know, and then the following two years, like after somebody dies, you go through so many stages, you know, and then there was the year before that where I was thinking about being in culture and what it felt like to be in culture right now and what it felt like to participate in the world um, in all these sorts of ways. And every time all through those three years that I was writing it, I was really trying to accurately capture what things felt like to me. And um, no, I didn't really have a form in mind when I started. And I thought that I wanted to write a history of art criticism, or I wanted to write about art criticism. Mm -hmm. There's this book that I love called um, Manet and His Critics um, about all the crit. Have you, do you know that book? No, I'm just nodding in in terms of reading reading this and the asparagus and everything. Yeah, so it's this book that I've had on my shelves for years, and I, I it's not the kind of thing you read all the way through. Like, well, maybe it is if you're the, if you're that kind of person, but for me, it was more just like. Um, the criticism that he received uh, when he showed at the various salons in Paris, um, what the critics wrote and you read, and I just, I love reading them because they're so wrong, but they're mm. so certain. Mm. Um, and 
it was so painful to him. He wasn't one of those artists that uh, could see himself as being, well, I'm better than the critic, so it doesn't affect me. He was really, really hurt. And he had met um, Baudelaire and Emile Zola as his friends kind of at once comforting him and telling him like, get over yourself. This is what happens to an artist. Anyway, so that's where I started thinking about mm -hmm. our criticism. Um, and, and it just kind of unfolded the whole book, the writing of the book unfolded in really surprising ways mm -hmm. over the, the next few years. I, I assumed that your father had died in the writing of the book, mm -hmm. but I didn't know that. Um, mm -hmm. And having lost my own father, it felt that part also felt so tremendously real to me. The, the passages about, um, I mean, I feel like I should just read them aloud, but <laughs> what it's like, what it's like being there at the end, what it's like when the breath enters you, what it's like, I mean, there's a, there's one part where you say, well, maybe she, maybe Mira could marry her father now that her father was dead. Um, the kind of grief, the inert grief state you go into afterwards that you can, which is almost like crawling into a leaf and sort of needing a friend to yeah. pull you out. Um, it felt like in a way the whole book was struggling to find a language around grief, which is in so many ways beyond language. Um, I don't know if you could speak to that idea of of grief and language. Yeah, I mean, for me, partly the reason that um, there wasn't a language for it, well, partly it's because you're not communicating with anybody and language is um, communication between people. And when you're grieving, you're not among people. Even if you are among people, you're detached. I remember going to a party several weeks after and somebody, uh, uh, somebody was telling me about her renovation and I was just like, <laughs> I have no words, you know, like this is, it was not even, it was beyond offensive. It was just completely, um, I just sort of felt stunned. Like this is not the world that I'm part of right now. Mm -hmm. um, so there was that element to, to it. Maybe there's no language because you're not trying to communicate it to anybody mm -hmm. and you don't really, you kind of know that you can't. And so there's like, the sense of futility about communicating it before you even try to communicate it. So mm -hmm. maybe no language gets developed because, and you don't really want to share it because it just mm -hmm. feels like it's between you and the person who died. It's not really, um, so there was that, but also the feeling for me was that the word grief felt really wrong. And I kept marveling at it, like, cause the word grief just sounds like depression or sadness. And I think what I felt was more uh, awake to a, a lot of other things that I had not ever been awake to before. So it didn't mm -hmm. feel like going to sleep. It felt like waking up into a different world. Um, yeah. You, there's a beautiful passage in the book where you talk about a room, grief as a room that you thought, that you thought when you lose someone that it would be like they go to another room and you write something about actually the whole room has changed. <laughs> like I'm going into another room entirely. And, um, the strangeness of a world where you could disappear into a leaf and come out again. Um, I once wrote a play called Melancholy Play where this character gets so, first she's melancholy in kind of a sexy way and it's kind of like, it's kind of like being in Paris in the springtime, but then she gets depressed and she becomes so depressed she turns into an almond. And so she's like, <laughs> you know, totally inert and her friends have to try to like go to her and pull her out of this almond state. Um, and to me, that's sort of how I read the leaf state, but also that it was peaceful and cool and quiet. And um, and in your book, I guess I also felt this question about the seasons and the world and the weather and the climate. And um, I mean, just this one, this one line, it's true that the world was failing at its one task of remaining a world. Pieces were breaking off. Seasons had become postmodern. Um, I feel that that part of greenness in the, in the entire book as well. And um, I just wonder, I mean, it, I, I don't really know what my question is because it's all in the book, really. Yeah, I know. You know, the relationship between that feeling of desperation at the world as a first draft failing and then one's private life being full of grief or this other word for grief. Yeah. 
it's funny like I also often feel like they're it's funny that we interview authors because there really aren't any questions. It's like <laughs> in the work or it's not. So yeah, so what are these interviews supposed to do if if they're not asking, if you don't want to ask the writer to like recapitulate what they already said better than mm -hmm. they could ever say it in a live interview. <laughs> I know. Um, well, the totally. thing is I could ask you super adjacent things like, um, uh, uh, did you really help make up the font for the cover? I, I did not make up the font for the cover, but I really, um, I mean, I'm completely in love with the cover um, in a way that it feels almost, it's uncanny, like how right the cover is um, mm -hmm. and uncanny how right the title is. Mm -hmm. And I didn't come up with a title and I didn't come up with the cover. And, you know, you are in the theater and I think both of us, um, because I also come from the world of the theater, understand collaboration to be um, either something uh, perfect, like a, this perfect extension of yourself and this perfect extension of the other person and, or like the absolute worst um, suffering <laughs> moment to moment. <laughs> um, I'm dealing with this editor right now for some other project that I'm working on. And every time she emails me, I, 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 I feel enraged. It's, mm -hmm. we're just completely out of sync. Um, mm -hmm. and I don't think there's anything wrong with her. I'm sure she's a good editor. She has this good job, but we're just so out of sync. And I hope none of my editors are listening to this and thinking that it's them. <laughs> if you're the, ed if that editor's not watching this to be sure, yeah, she's sure. completely not interested, but anyways, um, so yeah, like I think the cover, um, the title, all those things. And I was just texting with some friends of mine today who I met at McDowell, who are also all three artists um, in their own fields. And we, after McDowell, we got together uh, about nine months later or a year later and had like a little private retreat, the four of us. And I wrote some of the craziest passages in the book when I was with them. And mm -hmm. so just their energies in the same space as me um, I just love how art works that way, how it's not actually just your brain, mm. you know, how it is these signals that are passing between you and other people to make, make something. Um, well, and I, I love that about all of your work that I feel that theater collaborator in you in so many books where you're questioning the idea of what is a book, what is a single author, um, how do we make meaning, how do we how do we think about painting along with writing or how are we collaborating with the I Ching, you know, while writing motherhood. Um, and, and in this one, that's so interesting that you, that some of the writing energy was with other bodies and in, in space writing together. Was that during the yeah. pandemic? No, it was before the pandemic. Well, I think I love books. I love holding books. It's my favorite art form um, to engage in is like literature, but I don't like, what what historically or not even that historical but like i guess um we think of as the process of book writing which is a person alone writing their book because i think that nothing in the world i mean i'm just in a house now with two babies you know and those babies were made with each baby was made by two people like nothing in the world is made by one person alone mm. you know from from the very mm. beginning of life and so the idea that the writer is meant to be alone just seems, you know, that's how you get these anemic books or that's how you get mm -hmm. these kind of static books that are that can sometimes feel like repetitions of other books because there aren't other brains coming in and throwing you off and making it into something that you couldn't have anticipated when you started. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I really miss theater. Like I, mm -hmm. I'm sort of, and I kind of feel like, you know, the art form that you love Somebody, this writer, this Canadian writer, Barbara Gowdy, once said something to me. She said, um, we all practice our second love mm -hmm. as artists. And so she really wanted to be a concert pianist. And in her books, you know, she couldn't be a concert pianist because I guess she had more talent for literature. But there is something of that way of, you know, there is something of the concert pianist in her books. Like there is something about notes and harmony and melody, whatever. And I think for me, like my first love would be the theater. Mm. And I can't do it for various reasons, but I think, yeah, so your second, your first love gets transformed and sort of sublimated and expressed in your second love. Mm. Um, That's so interesting. I mean, I, I started out writing poetry and I think for a long mm. time 
didn't publish it or share it because I was busy writing theater, but also I felt quite vulnerable and naked in poetry as a form. And it's only recently I've been starting to publish it more. Um, but do, I, your prose also reads like poetry to me. Do you also write like what you call quote unquote poetry? Does, no. Does that, no. Not since I read, wrote a whole entire book about a boy in my biology class in, <laughs> when I was 16 years old or 15 years old. And after that, I just, I, I, when I think about poetry for myself, it's always connected to the sheer embarrassment of my first uh, ex experiments with poetry. It was a, but then, a full length book, like a book of poems about him? Yeah, it was about, probably about 35 poems. Oh. I think they were funny, but I think still like, and I tried to publish it. I actually sent it to publishers and thank God that book was not <laughs> ever published. I want so it. at the time. Yeah, you don't want how, it. How old were you? I don't know, 15. How old are you oh. when you're like in grade oh. 10? Something oh, like good. that. Yeah, wow. Um, but I can see that with your plays that you that your first love would have been poetry because there are so many poetic images, you know, um, that makes perfect sense. I guess I think of theater ultimately as kind of a three dimensional poem. And um, yeah. interesting that you if your first love is theater, you know, how that three dimensionality of theater comes into your writing and, and collaboration. Right. Um, and friendship, I, I feel like a lot of your in your in your writing, there's oh, there's always a deep evocation of friendship as as a kind of sacred um, text, I guess. I mean that there's yeah, I mean the friendship between um, between b between Mira and her fish love Annie. I mean it's a love story as well. But mm -hmm. I also just feel like you honor friendship in your books in a way that other stories don't have time for friendship as plot. Um, mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you might read a little bit about friendship. There's a mm -hmm. passage on 33. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I have to adjust my screen so I can't see my face. Now that I'm taking up the whole, just can't stand that. Okay. <laughs> Can we say that friendships were different then? That they were like lamps alone with you in your total privacy? One you know more than a dozen or two dozen people and you never knew when you would see them again. There was always the chance after you parted that it was for the last time. After a party, it was always possible that you would never see their faces ever again. It wasn't even something you thought about. Everyone had their own little life, which touched the lives of other people only at parties. Between the parties, there was no interaction with most. There was nothing show-offy about friendships then. Your friends were simply who was around. It didn't occur to anyone that it could be another way. If you liked your friends, that was okay. If you didn't like your friends, that was okay too. We were fine with living our mediocre lives. It didn't occur to anyone that we could have great ones. That was for people far away. Our lack of awareness of the scope of the world kept us from any great falseness. It was enough to know just four or five people and to have slept with two or three of them. Was there anything else to be ambitious for? Just an imagined immortality, a sense of one's own greatness, which could in no way be tested. It wasn't that long ago is the funny thing. We are, for the most part, all of us still alive, yet none of us keep in touch with the other ones. We only keep in touch with the friends we have made since the friendship revolution, which made being in touch of primary importance. The friends we knew from way back when, we felt content to let them slip away, to continue the traditions of the old world, to continue the traditions of the old world into now. Beautiful. And, and again, that's where it feels like realism to me, even though it's not, um, because if you, you, you describe it as the friendship revolution without ever saying the word social media, I mean, I feel like, the whole, like the, the whole book in a way is about the pre that and the post that without ever naming it. And I often feel like we're all human cyborgs now and we haven't culturally caught up to right. what that is. The concept of friendship hasn't even caught up. 
Um, right. There's some interesting questions in the chat. I wonder if I should um, read a couple of them. Sure, but uh, can I just ask you quickly yeah. before you do, like this yeah. idea of human cyborgs, because I had this really a crazy um, experience recently and I started thinking a lot about um, reality as um, a simulation and it's not an idea that I've ever entertained, but I had this experience and I was like, started to read books about it. I wonder if you have any ideas about, if you have any feelings or thoughts or intuitions about either the idea of a simulation or this cyborg, the cyborg thing, because yeah, if you're saying that we're all cyborgs, but we haven't caught up to it yet culturally, like what does that mean? I mean, I guess for me, it means we're uncomfortable, most of us when we leave home without our phones. So in that sense, our phones are part of our body now. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe they right. will be at some point, but effectively they kind of are. And they're always, um, we're always referring to them for human um, backup, you know, like in a conversation, we're like, oh, it's, we're not content to have a conversation with that. Well, let me show you a picture of, or let me show you the YouTube video of, or, I mean, my kids are interacting. It's like a collab, constant collaboration with their phone and the other people in the room. Yeah. So, I mean, what is that? <laughs> what does that mean? I think, yeah, and, and it'll be interesting, the humans that come that don't have complicated feelings about it like or if they do come and or don't have guilt about it or or who aren't always trying to get back to some idea of purity like the world without them I feel like it's a kind of frustrating time to be in because we do have this like old old ideas of purity and morality and the way to be in the world is not with your phone and that's yeah and I'm just like oh I kind of can't wait till humans mm -hmm. figure out the next relate since stage of this relationship, you know? Right, people who were just born with it. It's interesting because there's other things in the book I really relate to about being middle-aged. Like, I don't really go around feeling middle-aged, mm -mm. but, um, but there's stuff in your book about, about art criticism and, and, and cultural sort of, mm, the new things in culture, the exciting things going on in culture. And you talk about it as a, you know, a, someone who's in their 40s, you're, that you're not supposed to really hear it exactly. It's it's not for you. It's in a, it's in an adjacent room. Do you know the bit I'm talking about? Yeah, it's like the party is going on behind a closed door. And you can't really hear the party. Like that's what culture feels like. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that is it. It doesn't it feel like that. I don't know. Yes. Even if you're making culture and like it, it doesn't <laughs> feel like it's. I don't know. Uh, well. And you talk about this idea of the gods looking through the your eyes at the beloved and that that's sort of what's creating the sense of love and that the older you get, the sort of less shiny it becomes or the, the less you, you automatically feel that sparkly feeling of the gods looking through your eyes at the beloved. I mean, I, I think, I guess I bring it up because when you say, um, what will it be this next generation who is raised in the digital age and doesn't doesn't remember a time before. I, I feel like there's something about this novel that's suffused with with the time before, you know, with wobbly mm -hmm. lamp, you know, with like a woman who works at a lamp store and she gets to click off her her lamps that, that are sort of from the old world and across the street is the new world of only white lamps. Oh, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, I totally. Yeah, I think that that's, it's now like a, myth, a mythical place that world before it almost feels that way to me not even nostalgic just like yeah mythological or you can hardly believe it it was so close or it happened or you lived through it yeah which makes me think of um virginia wolf a little bit like virginia wolf's orlando where you know someone um, a man lives so long he lives you know through the centuries and then is able to look at the oddness of what came before and i also thought about the waves reading this book. I don't know if the waves. Mm, is, I love that book. Yeah. I don't know of any other book, honestly, that that has a sense of consciousness in the way that that this book describes consciousness. I suppose hmm. almost it's almost like the word is embodying the consciousness. Um, I don't. I don't really know how to describe it, uh, and that's what I love about it. Um, <laughs> Can you talk about Wolf a little bit or what her effect was on you? 
I read her late. I only probably read her for the first time about 10 years ago, like maybe in my early 30s or something or mid 30s. Um, I read The Waves. I was by the shore at, on a beach reading it. Um, yeah, I just couldn't believe how, I just couldn't believe it. Like there's no other book like it. And I don't, I think it was um, not a book that I reread. I don't try to learn from the books that I love. Like I just like mm. experiencing them. So I have no idea technically what she was doing there, but you you feel that it, that book just is inside you forever after, you, after mm. you've read it. Um, I'm not a Virginia Woolf completist. I haven't read all her books, but mm. um, I'm not really a completist about any author somehow. Mm. I don't think there's any author that I've read all their books. I yeah. love even, I, I never heard of being a completist before. Maybe I just made that word up. <laughs> I just made it up. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I feel like there's like a kind of academic or nerdy or obsessive approach to literature, and I just don't have that. It's it's like whatever sort of yeah. flows into my path, you know? And yeah. then. Uh -huh. Well, um, speaking of Wolf, there's this question in the chat from Bex that says, your prior two novels read so queer without actually having a a canonical queer protagonist. How did you fall into having a queer protagonist who is both queer in terms of love and queer in terms of becoming a literal leaf? How did I what? I guess she's, I guess the question is how did you fall into, which I don't know. Queerness? Queerness, or I like the idea of it, the queerness of the protagonist, but also the, queer, the queerness of story. I guess I don't really know what that word means to me because I don't really know always the way that people mean that word. Um, I mean, heterosexuality seems pretty queer to me too. Like it's all, it's all so <laughs> fucked up. Like it's, you know, none of it makes any sense. I'm not saying that queer, I just, it's all, all desire is strange. Like all desire is, so individual, so unexpected, throws you off your path, um, isn't connected to the systems that we live in. Um, and we're always trying to fit them in so that our desire makes us, our desire doesn't make us seem like we're not part of society. But I think like desire is really outside of society. It's so um it's you know animal or instinctual or soul or i've never i've never fallen in love with somebody that i um where it felt like well that was a good I idea and even if <laughs> even if i could make it into a good idea at first it was just like this is not this is not who i um think is you know this does, and, and it, I don't know how to put it really. Um, I, I'm not trying to say it in a way that insults people. I just mean more that it, um, yeah, it just all seems queer to me. It all seems queer to me. I think that should go on a, on a coffee cup. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was I going to ask you? Oh, desire. I, I love, um, the bits in the book about trying to find the right distance for desire, you know, trying to right. calibrate it. And I mean, I'm trying to see if I have a, if I have it written down where that section is, but it feels yeah. like a question of calibration. And also, I mean, what's, what's interesting too, in terms of it all seems queer to me, you know, the idea of, we're also talking about bears, fishes, um, and a bird, you know, so it's, we're also talking about creatures. I mean, they're not actually right. a bird or are they, you know, I, I'm teaching this class at Yale right now, um, that I call Ovid and plays of transformation where we read Ovid's metamorphosis and then write plays where you have to have at least one beast, one song and one sudden transformation. Uh -huh. And I feel like, you know, in Ovid, people are turning into animals all the time or people are turning into animal in order to rape someone or to, to memorialize a love or just, you know, it's like, why do we transform? What, what, 
in a fairy tale, um, what makes things so extreme emotionally that we have to become a beast or we have to crawl into a leaf? Um, and I guess it also makes me flash on that wonderful children's book that you wrote. Um, we need a horse. Yeah, I love it so much. And, and just thinking about animals and the, the, mm -hmm. the end of the book, you know, ends with a father's bedtime story, you know, to a child. Like there's something in the pleasure of the tale told mm -hmm. uh, with ongoing transformation that I'm, I'm trying to trying to make sense of, I guess, in my own writing as a structure for, for feeling. Um, and mm -hmm. I wonder, like, do you, do you get inspired by fairy tales or Ovid or children's books, you know? I mean, not, uh, I, I just think, well, those are the first stories that we hear, you know, the stories that are were told that are read to us um, or are made up you know, for us. And so you can't, you can never shake that. Um, it's always in you as like the primitive, most original form of storytelling. And it's storytelling is love, you know, and theater, I guess, is um, one person or a group of people t literally telling a story to an audience. Um, and that's what the bedtime story is. It's like a parent or guardian or whatever, telling a story to a child. Um, and I think when I write my books, I'm always thinking, well, like, who's the person that's telling this story and who are they telling it to? And I, I think those questions matter and create the form and the structure of the book. And I want that question to be part of the narrative of the book because I want the book to have within it the reason that it was written. It wasn't mm -hmm. written just so I could write a book. Mm -hmm. It had its own reason for having to be told. And I want the book to say what that reason is or to display what that reason is. Um, I don't know why, but it just seems to me like the most interesting narrative, the most interesting thing you can reveal in the narrative is why the book was written or, mm -hmm. or how it was written or who it was written to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that's really the story. The story is how did this book come to be in this person's hands? That's mm -hmm. the story of a book, I think, mm -hmm. for me. That's the interesting story, yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Another question just came in and I haven't, I haven't gotten to them all yet. Um, about the birds, the bears and the fish it's from Maddie, are we stuck within the limits of our nature? Could a bear become a bird? Could a fish become a bear? Incidentally, I love this taxonomy even as it stressed me out and it reminded <laughs> me of Milan Kundera's own four types those who need a public of unknown eyes, those who need familiar eyes, those who want to be in the eyes of the person they love and the dreamers who live to be seen by an imagined being. That's oh, that's beautiful. I didn't know about that taxonomy. I, did, I, I thought about Milan Kundera a couple of times while reading hmm. this. Um, yeah. Well, I just don't have the answer to that question, Maddie, because I really feel like with this book, I only put into it what I absolutely knew for sure, like what was revealed to me, so to speak, in the writing of it. And there was nothing outside it that I knew. So I don't have anything that is uh, relevant to the book that I wrote down, I put in. And everything that's, that's not filled in is because I don't know really the answer. I would just be making it up. So, um, I don't know. <laughs> Are you a Kundera fan? I haven't read him since my early 20s, but I I, I read um, the famous one, The Bearable yeah. Lightness of Being, and I really did love it. Yeah, but I yeah, just haven't yeah. read it in so long. I'm so happy I can be at this age where I'm like, I haven't read that in two decades. Like, I've always <laughs> thought that that was such a romantic thing to be able to say, you know? I haven't read that book in 30 years. You know, it's like, well, I haven't read that book in 30 years. Um. I'm sure I would like it if I liked it then. I might like it in a new way. Mm. Um, and this question is from Ruby. Grief is so individuated. I experienced my dad's passing in 2020 and still do as pockets of grief. I see so many traditions in your work, Jewish, of course, turning into a leaf or tree is such an ancient idea, especially in Indian traditions. Did you ponder any Indian traditions? Um. 
I didn't ponder any traditions really. I mean, I, I really was like in communication with my own, my own environment physically and my own sense of um, my, my father's spirit and where it was and what had happened to it. And I wasn't really reading religious texts. I tried actually, and I just found them, they weren't what I wanted. Um, so no, I wasn't drawing from any traditions. Mm -hmm. And then this from Anna, how do you overcome your inner critic? I don't, I don't think it has to be overcome. I mean, right. I have it. I mean, everyone has it, but I think you need it to make good work. Like, so for me, my inner critic tells me like, that's a bad paragraph. Don't put it in the book. Or, you know, there's something in this draft that is not working. And so I, I think it's really, you have to have an, in, you have to have that critic. That is your taste, you know, and mm -hmm. that's, um, that's how you make something that is to your taste. And I, but I also like externalizing my inner critic and having outer critics. I'm always sharing my book with my book with and drafts of the book with friends. I want to hear other people's criticism because I think, yeah, like sometimes you're in my case, I think sometimes my inner critic is not critical enough. So I want a friend to read it. And it's not so much what they say, but the enthusiasm with which they r respond to the draft. So, you know, with this book, I might have had a friend say, oh, yeah, it's really good. I'm like, I don't want them just to be like, oh, yeah, it's really good. I want them to say, like, Sheila, how did you write such a beautiful book? You know, and if they don't say that, then I, I know that it's not done, you know? So I think critics inner and outer are so important because I think one is inclined to be kind of lazy and to sort of want whatever you write to be good enough because everyone just wants to be done. Even though the only pleasure is writing it, you still always just want to be done. And so I feel like you need the outer critic who's a friend and a series of friends to tell you that you're not done. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but I don't have an inner critic that prevents me from writing. So I think that that's, uh, yeah, if you have an inner critic that is preventing you from actually making something, if it's so strong that you can't even experience the, your creativity, that's like a, that's a different situation. And mm -hmm. that just has to be, I, in that case, would, would write down everything that the critic was saying and just write a book called The Critic and just have it just be like, <laughs> you know, because that, if those are the sentences in your head, those are the sentences that want to come out. And maybe it's not criticizing, maybe it's, Maybe that's a more interesting voice, your inner critic, than whatever it is with, that you were writing. I love that idea. I'm, I'm going to steal that. That's great. Um, <laughs> this question's related to that one. It's um, from Sophie. Thinking of Manet's critics and this current out of sync editor, how do you hold on to your certainty and your voice when faced with collaborators or critics who are not speaking your language? Well, in that case, I just, I asked a couple of friends, like there were certain sentences that this editor had problems with, and I was fairly sure that this editor was wrong, but I, just to double check, I emailed a few friends and I said, well, which sentence is better, this one or this one? And I did it with the four or five sentences that this editor wanted me to change. And, <laughs> and they confirmed that I was right. And so I, I usually don't like to have any conflict with people that I work with. I like to have a very warm, affectionate relationship with everybody. Um, so it was very hard to sort of be a bitch, you know, and uh, it's really against my nature. And I don't want to have that kind of relationship with an editor. Um, I don't want to be um, aggressive. But I kind of had to be in this case. And yeah, it's so unpleasant. I mean, I think sometimes you just have to say no. Yes, know? but then if you say no and they say, I don't care if you said no, this is the way it is, Yeah, you know, and then you have to say, well, no, actually I wrote these sentences in a certain way. Like they're not, you know, they have a rhythm to them and I can hear the rhythm and you can't hear the rhythm, but there is a rhythm to them. and. I don't think that this, I'm sure that this person just doesn't usually work with somebody like me and, and to this person, I must seem like a, 
a diva or something, you know, and just, I don't know. I, 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 yeah, I mean, I agree. And it's, it's a weird situation when you're in, um, when you find yourself in a collaboration where someone is getting in the way of your rhythm, um, it's really awkward. Um, where do you think that rhythm comes from? Because your your place have that too. Like they have this heartbeat, this rhythm that's the same, you know, that's you, that's recognizably you. So where do you think that comes from? Do you think that's something that you um, just sort of find and develop over the years? Or do you think it's more metabolic than that? I think it's kind of metabolic. I mean, I remember um, Wolf once wrote to Vita Sackville West, style is a very simple matter it's just rhythm and i think mm -hmm. that's kind of true and that's where, mm -hmm. where poetry comes from too i once had a i was teaching poetry to a little boy in queens and we did like an ars poetica like how should a what should a poem be and he wrote this very beautiful little poem that i always keep in mind i keep it on a lamp on my desk and he said a poem is not so hard if you sing while you think and i was like ah that's it you, you're yes just that is at the same time and that produces Absolutely. rhythm. That's a great poem. That's <laughs> such a good poem. Yeah. Um, let's see. There's another question here. Um, in your interview for the LARB or L-A-R-B, you talked about losing your imagination at a young age. I think it was early 20s. I'm experiencing the same thing at the same age. What advice would you give to a writer who feels like they are experiencing a sort of creative death at such a young age? I mean, I don't know if losing your imagination is a creative death. It's just a transformation from childhood to adulthood. And you probably just have to find what art is to some to your present self. You kind of have to reinvent art all the way through your life because your experience in the world is constantly changing. So when I yeah, when I lost my imagination, or that's what I—that's how it was felt to me. Um, I was like, okay, well, I guess I just have to become more interested in in everything else there is. I've got to become more interested in like the granular realism of this world. I guess I've got to become more interested in dialogue. I, you know, what is there for me? You know, um, so like, I, you know, like any death, um, uh, there, there's something. I, you know, there's. I'm trying to say, I'm not trying not to say like after a death, there's a rebirth, but like you just have, I think that it is, um, there's more to be found and you just have to look at new places. Mm -hmm. And it's funny how shifting genre can help too sometimes, you know, I, I think of it like a sailboat, like tacking a little bit, like, or crop rotation, you know, like you burn a field in order to keep it fertile for the next season. So maybe I'll write a play, then I'll write a prose, and then I'll write a poem, and then I'll go back. You know, so right. sometimes if your imagination is mm, feels flat, there can be a new form to, um, to look at the content. Yeah, a new form or a new process. Like maybe there's just like a new way of working where it's not, um, yeah, that's another kind of crop rotation, right? Like just to find a completely new way of writing. Mm -hmm. So maybe you're writing by speaking into a microphone or maybe you're, you're writing by um, going to your bookshelf and pulling down books and like randomly opening to sentences and starting with that sentence. And maybe you're completely like imitating the voice of a writer that you love and you're doing some kind of transfer, you know, yeah, you, maybe you just have to like actually completely discard your voice and start over again with somebody else's voice. So yeah, there's all sorts of things. Have you done um, all of for, those things? Sheila? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm always trying to figure out um, what else there is. Hmm. Um, speaking of formal experiments, I've been so enjoying your New York Times serial oh. where you alphabetize journals. Um, I don't know folks in the audience have, have read this. How's that been? And, 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 and what did you learn by alphabetizing? Like, did you realize, oh my God, I, I have so many I's or I, there's so few J's? There's a lot of I's. There are a few J's. <laughs> um, so for those who are watching who don't know, it's um, this sort of 10 week serial in the New York Times where 
it's this project that I've been working on for 12 years, actually, where I took like 500,000 words of my journals and alphabetized them using Excel, um, sort of like the A to Z function, alphabetized the journals, 10 years of journals by sentence, by the first letter of the sentence. And then I've been editing it for 12 years, like just, just sort of what's the right form for it? Is it a book? Is it this? Should every sentence be on its own line? That's how it was for 10 years. Every sentence was on its own line. And then I had a um, somebody, um, Lisa Naftalin, who's a book designer, put them all in a paragraph with lots of spaces between each sentence. So I was like, oh, actually, they, it's one long paragraph. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing that I, I mean, the thing that I realized was like, I only really have three or four things that I think about. And I thought that I had more. And <laughs> it was kind of like, I, all I thought about was like, should I leave Toronto? I thought about the whatever man I was sleeping with. And I thought about writing and like how to write <laughs> and how, you know, whatever was going on with my writing. And that was it. And so much, and, and, and I mean, Freud said the only two things in life are work and love. And so I guess it's like, okay, work and love and like what city should I live in, in my case. So it's, <laughs> yeah, but that was kind of sobering. I love that. I mean, um, it's fascinating because journals theoretically are um, records of chronology. And so right. disrupting that is really fascinating to me. I remember right. going through journal once and just crossing out everything that was abstract because I found it irritating oh, and circling wow. anything that was like a noun that was concrete, like what I ate for breakfast or potato. I would just circle those things. <laughs> About the other things, but the alphabetizing is fascinating. Um, so why did you do that? Were you using that? What What was the motivation behind doing that and what came out of it? I can't remember. I mean, I think it was in my early 20s and I was maybe working on a new play and maybe the, the journal was sort of adjacent to the play. So right. I was kind of looking at it for compost and being like, there's nothing. It's abstract. I hate, you know, there's it's nothing. It's I know. Involved. I don't care. I don't care how you feel. I just I know exactly know, like what you thought. Did you eat a potato or did you not? I know. Um, I know. <laughs> but yeah, work. I mean, work, love, death. I mean, those seem like the big ones. Um, yeah. Um, whether to move you, to New York or whether to move to New York. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or my renovation. Um, there's a question on grief. A powerful Cormac McCarthy quote is when it comes to grief, the normal rules of exchange do not apply because grief transcends value. A man would give entire nations to lift grief off his heart. And yet you cannot buy anything with grief because grief is worthless. Um, then the question is, does this resonate for you? I didn't feel like I would buy nations or what do you say, sell nations to lift the grief off my heart. I I found it an interesting time. Um, I found it full of in new information and new sensations and new relationships and I wouldn't have um, thrown it away. Mm. Um, a, a question that's very straightforward here. Do you write your journals by hand or do you type them? No, type, I can't read my own handwriting. <laughs> I made I made a very concerted effort in grade four to write in a messy way because I thought that was artistic and that was how a writer would write so messy and I just I never was able to recover the slowness that it takes to it's just too slow to make every yeah. letter appear I can't mm -hmm. I, I I write by hand now and then but it's I made the journals no I've always either typed them on a typewriter or on a computer. Yeah, same. It's too slow. It can't. Yeah, it can't go as fast as the thoughts, and then it's irritating. Totally. Um, <laughs> uh, this question is: How do you decide something works or doesn't? What makes it ready to share, or give to the world? And I guess I have sort of a follow up with that, particularly with the New York Times serial, and alphabetizing your journals. Like, at what point did that feel ready? And because it's quite, in a way, quite intimate. Even though, in a way, it's not because it's the form gives you some distance on the personal information, but what what made it feel ready or 
or what made your color feel ready? Um, and what was the question in the chat? It was, it was like, how, how do, you do you know if something's like, good? How do you decide if it works or not? How do you know if it's ready to share or give to the world? If I like to reread it, if I just love to reread it, then it's, I figure it's good. Mm -hmm. And if I, if I don't like to read it, I just, I put it in a file I call delete. So I don't have the existential anxiety of like, oh my God, what if I, that was great. And I want to go back to it. So I just put it in a file called delete and I don't have to look at it. If I don't want to look at it, it's no good. Mm -hmm. If I just want to like stare at it, like a beautiful face, <laughs> like it's good. <laughs> um, and and we'll get better as I edit it and refine it and like make the sentences a little uh, more shapely. Um, for the diaries thing, you know, I had a publishing contract almost for that in 2013. And then at the last minute, I, I thought I'm not ready to publish this. I'm not ready. It's too close to the time that I wrote the journals. I don't think I found exactly the right form for it yet. Um, but then the New York Times asked me if I could give them a piece of fiction that could be serialized and I was just like I can't write in that way I don't think I can write something on command for the New York Times that's a piece of fiction in 10 weeks and then mm -hmm. I so I said that's not for me that project and then I kind of thought about it my agents like just think about it and so I thought about it for another few days and I was like well I wonder if this this diary project would work mm -hmm. and um you know, the file on my computer of the diary project, which I think I'll still publish as a book, but it's 90,000 words. And then okay. the diaries column is about 1200 words a week over 10 weeks. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a small fraction of that. Mm -hmm. And I edited all of it together before it started running in the times, because I didn't want to lose my nerve once it was out in the world. I didn't want to just start hiding. So mm -hmm. I did it all. I edited, I did all, all of the columns in the summer. Mm -hmm. And now I'm like shaping them a little bit week to week just to just because it's always nice to look over something again. Mm. But I didn't feel ready for it at all. I was completely terrified. I was just completely terrified. Have you had interesting reactions to it? Um, yeah, like people telling me that now they're doing that to their journals. And I like the idea that, that that's one of the things that it has spawned. People seem to like it. Yeah, I, yeah. I didn't know that was going to happen. Yeah. Um, so here's a comment. OK, this is not a question from Juliet, but your rhythm is genius and so unique as only one of many your read, of your readers can I say, it's the sound of your work pulsing inside of my heart that moves it forward oh, wow. in places. It's not just your words, they're good words, sure, <laughs> but it's your rhythm that is so distinct and potent. Whatever editor you ever need to wrestle in order to preserve it, do it. And thank you already for doing it. That's a really beautiful comment. Thank you so much for saying that. I remember being young and like being like 11 or 12 and trying to learn a word a day, like big words. Mm -hmm. And I just know, I, I just think I actually like to use, and I think you do too. I think I just like to use simple words because mm -hmm. I do think it's in the rhythm. I want to use words that most people know. Yep. I think it's also interesting about what makes you keep reading a story is a question I think a lot about as a playwright or, you know, reader and um your book i found really impossible to put down and it's interesting thinking about you doing a serialized thing because i don't think of you as you're not a plot driven writer per se mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it's like it's like addiction to voice it's like what's the mm -hmm. voice gonna say next what's the voice gonna do next i mean it's i don't think we're wondering like is she gonna come out of the leaf like i think we would have been okay if she stayed in the leaf if she kept having interesting observations within the leaf. But um, I think that observation, I, yeah. That makes me just think about, sorry for interrupting. And that makes me think about um, your observation about friendship earlier. And it's like, you're not friends with something because you, somebody, because you want to see what's going to happen to them next. Like you're friends with somebody because you like their way of being in the world. You like talking to them. You like the atmosphere, the, their energy, mm -hmm. how you feel in the same room as them. It's not like, I'm friends with this person because I want to see what crazy things going to happen to them next. And so mm -hmm. I feel like a book and art can be the same thing. It's just like somebody, it's like, who do you want to be near? You know, mm -hmm. what do you want to be near? It's so beautiful. I mean, yeah. What, who do you want to be near? Yeah. I think we get obsessed with love narratives um, because you want to see what happens next. Like, will they or won't they? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. wait, so 
like, and, and goes back to the question of queerness, I think, in the work too, you know, that hmm. a traditional, the novel traditionally has a marriage plot and they, they get married right. and then it's over and you're doing something so different, I think. Um, Maybe it's queer if you don't try to fit it in with, if you don't try to, or you are unable to fit it in with what other people are doing, or I don't know, like there's a way in which like, where it's queer if you're not trying to tame it, you know, mm -hmm. somehow. I don't know, I'm still thinking about this question of queer, like, mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, there's one more nice comment here. Thank you for your- Are you trying to tame it, but you can't? <laughs> no, I'm still thinking. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you for your insight on grief. No question. Just thank you for helping me open to new things and not turn in and withdraw. Thank you from Jeff. Um, yeah, it's just like somebody dies and then there's all this other space that fills in that space that was taken up with that relationship. And it's completely unexpected what like, you know, it's like nature abhors a vacuum, like just like all this stuff sort of <sighs> I experienced it like swoops in, you know, and like, oh, that person's not there. Well, here's all this other stuff. Like here's, here's trees and sky and nature, blah, 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 you know, it's like, cause well, that was my experience. I don't think every death is, every experience of grief is the same, but that was mine. That's so interesting. I feel like when my father died, I was young, I was 20 and nothing really filled the vacuum for a, a good t amount of time. And I think I guess that in the literature, that's what they call complicated grief, you know, when you really can't move past, like there's no movement, you know, there's stasis. Um, yeah. I think if you lose a child, I think if you lose somebody in an accident, I think there's all different kinds of experiences of grief. I think mine was very mystical, but I don't think it's, mm -hmm. I don't expect every time I lose somebody, it's going to be that way. Mm -hmm. This is a, such a specific question from Peter. Would you ever write a collaborative essay with McKenna Goodman? You two are my favorites and two of my biggest inspirations as a writer. Well, I'm visiting her in Vermont, where you are, Sarah, uh, in, a couple, in a couple months. So who knows? Um, I think she's brilliant. She wrote this book called The Shame, which I love. And she's actually the person who gave me the title Pure Color. So um, I don't think it's beyond the realm of possibilities that we will continue to make things together. How did she come up with that? She was one of the first people to read the book. Um, well, I mean, she was the first person to read a certain draft of the book. Let's say the second draft. I don't really know what drafts are, but let's say every time I share it with a new group of people, that's a draft. So I think she it, it, she read a draft that was closest to this. The first time it was sort of closer, closer to this form. Before that, it was like about a prince. It was just very different. Mm. But she knew that I was having trouble with the title and she just said, how, we were on the phone, she said, how about pure color? Which is, um, there's a passage in the book about pure color and I don't know how, why she pulled that out, but I don't think I would have ever found that, uh, found those words and thought, I just don't, I wouldn't have found the title. I wouldn't have found that title. Yeah. Titles are funny. They have to be right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And this is a really stupid question, but do Canadians always spell color C-O-L-O-U-R? Do you always use the British? Yeah, it's always the O-U instead of the O. Behavior, um, any of those words. I just got back uh, a piece from an editor who I love to work with, and all of the Canadian spellings were changed to the American spellings. I, I can't, it just doesn't, just doesn't look right to me without the U. I know, it's funny, I, I've, the gray for me the spelling needs to be g r e y even though for americans it's g r a y but i read enough books as a child mm -hmm. that's the g r e y that the color itself looks that way it's kind of bizarre totally. yeah for sure um we have time maybe for one more question i, I did want to ask a question about optimism i guess um the the idea of the the first draft in the book and god and mm -hmm. you know the idea that well maybe this is just the first draft and that's okay if it ends um which i found comforting do you ultimately feel you know hopeful about that if, if indeed we're living in a first draft and and that's it 
Yeah, I don't know why. I mean, it's horrible. There's going to be so much suffering. I, I don't feel good about all the suffering that's going to come to people. Um, but I don't really feel very sentimental about humanity mm. um, somehow. I mean, I, I love people. Um, I like making art for people. I love art. But I don't really care for the universe, whether humans live another million years or a hundred thousand years or a thousand years, just feels completely like it doesn't. Yeah, I, I don't want humans to suffer, but I don't, the ultimate fate doesn't. I feel worse for the animals. I feel worse when I hear that animals are going extinct mm -hmm. than, than the idea of humans going extinct. I don't know, I don't know why. Well, I, I love this idea of, of God making a first draft and then making a second draft and, you know, artists being similar to God, not in the way they, they look like God, but because they both care about making art. And um, anyway, it's so such a beautiful book. I'm just going yeah. to for people again. Um, and any other more burning questions from the group or are we sort of at time? I think uh, we're at time. We're at time. Great. What a fantastic conversation thank you so much thank you to everyone watching to all of our partner bookstores congratulations on the book um, we love it we're going to be selling it at all of our stores and um and it's just wonderful to hear to hear you and sarah you were just terrific as a moderator and and, and I think everyone watching, we had so many questions, which is always a sign of people feeling, you know, <laughs> really involved with what's happening. So thank you both very much for joining us. Yes, thank you both. And thank you to everyone who came and I hope you enjoy the book. And yes, thank you, Sarah, for your oh, incredible you. moderation. <laughs> um, be well and be well, everyone out there. Thank you.